lesser views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe we all watched in horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder how they fell so fast well maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask don't you think it's strange there were no fighter jets did someone give the order not to intercept and if they really scrambled then why'd they fly so slow maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know and where was our president George W that fool he was visiting with children at an elementary school. Hello, and when he heard this is the Bill news, Olson, your host of 9-11 was an inside job. He didn't seem Now, uh, when I started this show, he just I just started doing, a you know, book while all the those event itself. Burned. But it turns out that the event itself was nothing more than a marker where their subterfuge had reached the level of awareness of the population, and now everything else is out there where we're aware of it. Well, the problem is that we have a kind of a learning curve. It, it's taken a long, long time for people to catch up to this level of understanding about 9-11, but what the opposition, the, the, the globalists are counting on is hitting us boom, 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 so fast we can't react to what's going on. We're going to have information overload, event overload. That's what we're experiencing right now. We need, you know, I, I begin to admire Alex Jones's efforts even more. He, I mean, the organization he's putting together, he's got researchers and they can keep on top of all the subjects he does. It's hard. It's very hard to keep on top of just one of these subjects. But on top of all of them, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, now, we're going to start today's show, uh, I guess, for lack of a better idea, I guess. It's, uh, uh, I'm going to show you a little six-minute Alex Jones cut where... Uh, the BBC has done several hit pieces for the, uh, you know, about the 9/11 groups. They've normally marginalized us, our group and like that. Well, I don't understand the the circumstances exactly, but for some reason they they've come back to Alex Jones's studio to ask him some questions about 9/11, and it's kind of amusing to hear. But at the same time, it's a great, uh, you know, kind of a list. A 9/11 list. So we're going to go ahead and listen to Alex Jones talk about 9/11 to the BBC. The BBC here, and they want me to talk about 9/11. And you know, I don't think the BBC will uh, cover this. I mean, I, 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 and I'll cover real issues with 9/11. The BBC on two different channels, 24 and World reported that Building 7, the 47-story skyscraper, the biggest building in over 30 states, in most cities it'd be the biggest building, the CIA, FBI based in it, the Homeland Security, previous to that Federal Security Building, the State Security Building, all based inside of there. And it falls in its own footprint, and we have the police on video on CNN saying, get back, they're going to blow it up, they're going to bring it down. I've interviewed the cops that were there. They said, yeah, there was a 10-second... Uh, countdown. All of this happened. And BBC reported 25 minutes before it fell that it had fallen into its own footprint. A building that had some fires in it. 
And I've interviewed Barry Jennings before he mysteriously died a few weeks later, who was the deputy head of emergency management in New York, saying that bombs went off in the building. And then, of course, he had to die uh, soon after. Uh, deputy head of emergency management. It's just incredible. I mean, does the BBC want to talk about Bush, according to Newsweek and MSNBC, signing a launch order uh, to attack Afghanistan the day before 9-11 and that 18,000 British troops and 44,000 U.S. troops had massed in the stands around Afghanistan and carrier attack fleets were already in position ahead of the staged event or NORAD standing down, something that never before happened, and then the Fed's lying and saying we did no intercepts the year before except Payne Stewart and turned out it was over 150. Or perhaps we should talk about Stephen Butler, the head of the Defense Language School, who went public and said these hijackers were trained at U.S. bases, including our base. Or mainstream news reporting that Muhammad Atta and others were trained at other U.S. bases. Or Mr. Springman, former head of the U.S. Uh, embassy, a visa department. His associates told him they were ordered to let Muhammad Atta and others back into the U.S. in the year before 9-11 from their Al-Qaeda summit because they were really U.S. government agents. I'm just supposed to ignore all that and, uh oh, but it gets better. You see, if I have a view, if I have an idea, if I don't believe what I'm told, if I have critical thinking that doesn't absolutely agree with whatever I'm told, if the, if the government tells you the earth is flat and you don't agree with it, you're a conspiracy theorist. 500 years ago, you were a heretic and were burned at the stake or put on house arrest like Galileo. But today, today, conspiracy theory is the heresy. But see, they've used that so much it doesn't work anymore on every front. Even when the mainstream media, in my opinion, is telling the truth about something, the dinosaur dying media... People don't believe it in major polls. Uh, the, the, the BBC, uh, ABC News, they could tell the general public the sky is blue, and it's true. But they wouldn't believe it because they've been caught in so many reckless uh, manipulations of the facts. And so I proudly take the heretic's uh, letter, scarlet letter, onto myself uh, that, that, that I am someone that questions what I'm told. You see... I remember the night of 9-11. I've been on air off and on all day, and they, and they said, oh, we found one of the hijackers' passports in the wreckage of the collapsed towers. Now, now remember, there's several feet of asbestos and concrete dust, millions of papers conservatively blowing around, body parts aren't bigger than an inch long, and magically, magically, right there, right there in front of everyone is one of the hijackers passports proving they did it and one of the other hijackers bags got stuck in the conveyor belt and didn't make it with all the admissions and a car with all the admissions of how they did it just right there open and shut now this plane at 500 plus miles an hour flies into the building and and off their person the passport goes through the fireball through the building the, the plane is vaporized out, but wait, it gets better. It's like Gollum's ring. It calls to you. And, and as I've said earlier, it's made out of Thor's hammer, stuff that's indestructible, like the center of a sun. It falls to the ground and is found that day and produced the next day of the world by the FBI. They found it in all the millions of papers and the dust and the dead and the fires and the smoldering slag. Over a thousand degrees hotter than kerosene can burn, but <laughs> never mind the fact that months later there was molten slag down on the bottom. Um, all of that happened. And then wait, wait, it gets better. They found another passport, two, almost completely undamaged. And they found another one at Flight 93. The whole plane disappears into the ground. Just, just disappears, engine miles away. But the plane disappears into a hole in the ground. But the passport didn't. Oh, no, they had that one, too, because it's made of a substance, like a quark's gluon particle that, that, is, that is impregnable. They ought to build Abrams tanks out of this. I mean, they could have our special forces wear what that passport was made out of and then just tank rounds would bounce off of them like Superman. 
I mean, reportedly, if you eat one of these passports, you become Superman. I, I mean, it's from another planet. It's from Krypton. Okay, I mean, uh, again, and, but if you don't believe that those passports came magically out to the ground, were found, and presented to the public, I mean, it's incredible that they were found, much less they survived. You're a conspiracy theorist. You're going to buy whatever you're told. Okay, yeah, man, that's really funny, though. Uh, <laughs> passports from the planet Krypton that will withstand anything. That's right. Build, build your body armor out of it. That, that's great. He has a great sense of humor. Well, this isn't just a show about the Alex Jones show, but it seems to be that way. I'm going to play another cut from Alex Jones. He's beginning to realize his power. He's got over 5 million worldwide radio listeners, radio, internet, TV, ra internet listeners. And apparently that's the number one show in the world now on any internet <clears throat> is the Alex Jones show. And it's beginning to show its influence. The other day they had another one of those events at the TSA, you know, groping at the um, airports in Texas where, you know, the hands down the pants and feeling the genitalia of the women and children and like that. And Jesse Ventura is trying to uh, uh, have a lawsuit to stop them from doing that. And other people are doing it in other states as well. Uh, Texas wanted to criminalize it. But all of a sudden, the, I mean, the... Uh, uh, House of Texas voted unanimously for the measure to criminalize groping by the TSA. And uh, when it went to the Senate, it was somehow quickly defeated. And this is a little story about that. But Jones is beginning to get uh, a sense of his power. He, ha he really has some influence in the world. And uh, just by getting angry about the TSA groping, he said, all right, Everybody, I want you to meet me down there at the, I'm going down there right now to the, to the state uh, capitol, and I'm going to start complaining to the, pub, to the uh, elected officials about the TSA. And he had a group of people huge down there. Well, <clears throat> in another world, he just called for, uh, since today, June 11th, is the day that the Bilderbergs are meeting in Switzerland, in San Moritz, Switzerland. Uh, Alex Jones called for everybody in the Swiss, Switzerland and European area to merge on them and do their protests. Uh, he's really getting some power. And we're going to show this one about the, the TSA protest. This is a, a little bit less than nine minutes long. But this will give you an idea that, you know, one person really can make a difference. So let her rip. Oh, no. Okay, well... <laughs> Okay, uh, stand by, folks. I'm going to go take care of that. About a week and a half ago, we learned that the Justice Department had twisted arms in the Texas State Senate to block a unanimous House vote to criminally ban the molestation of Texas citizens at airports at the hands of the federal goon force, the TSA. And so in about an hour and a half, we uh, had a crowd of over 100 people show up spontaneously down at the Texas State Capitol, and we marched in to that Capitol and went to the steps of the Senate floor where, where the police blocked us and let them know in no uncertain terms that we were not their slaves. So I said, we got to go down there and we got to let these people know we don't appreciate what they're doing. This criminal government will follow the will of the people and the Constitution. Liberty is only rising. We have only begun to fight. And we will fight everywhere. And we will never surrender. Treason! 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 It is not government's job uh, to basically bully and dominate the population. And the Texas State Police uh, did the right thing. They did not behave as tyrants. And they protected our right to go into our Capitol building that our tax money built with our public servants 
who serve us so that we could tell them that we were very displeased with them. The First Amendment is king. The right of religion, the right of the press, the right to protest, to assemble, the right to petition. It's all there in the First Amendment. And the First Amendment's under attack. It started under Clinton with no uh, protest zones. They put you in free speech zones. It expanded under Bush. And now under Obama, it has exploded. One of my great camera guys, Rob Dew, was arrested at G20 in Pittsburgh for just trying to film the police attacking peaceful crowds. When the crowds dispersed, the police then went to the local university with people out at the park at night and told them nobody allowed out at night. All part of a bullying exercise against citizens. Uh, we saw the same thing a year and a half ago uh, in Kansas City, and the Kansas City Star picked it up. Uh, my guys were a half mile away from the private Federal Reserve branch bank, the folks that have stolen $27 trillion of U.S. taxpayer money, and the Federal Reserve had private security guards with guns come off the Federal Reserve property, drive a half mile where they saw my guys getting a distant shot of the Federal Reserve for B-roll for an upcoming film, and these goons off their jurisdiction, off their private property, came over with their guns, said, give us your IDs. They gave them the IDs because I've told my guys to try to not get you know, an altercation. These folks think they're God. And, and, and Rob and, and Aaron said, well, we're here at a World War I memorial that is a city park. You're off your jurisdiction. You, you, you're not even a federal officer. You're a security guard. And the guys said, look, get out of here. It's going to get bad. You go to jail or you can leave. Are you a police officer, sir? We do have arrest powers. Do you want to go to jail? Am I under arrest? No, you're not under arrest. Not yet. You need to leave. You're encroaching on our First Amendment right. No, we are not. You see, there's this idea that when we've been in D.C. just filming the Washington Monument, security guards march over, then police and say, can't film. And we say, oh, really? We called to get a permit, uh, and the city is permit-free because it's freedom. You're allowed to have video cameras. But we just wanted to see what would happen. Uh, and it, it's happened to other film crews that I know that go to D.C. with mainline television. There's this attitude of letting you know that you're a little slave. And we see this all over the country. I've seen police, it's, it's happened to myself in New York, and it's happened yes, to We Are Change. It's, a uh, it's in our film Truth Rising. Walk over and say, turn your camera off, just when you're on a street corner. You go, why? And some cop that can barely speak English starts threatening. This is a private well, listen, you want me to take that camera? You want to show me what you filmed? This is the essence of losing our freedoms. If government can trample on the Bill of Rights of the Constitution, they can take your private property rights. They can take your pensions. They can search your home without warrants. Uh, and, and, and courts are now ruling all over the country, federal and state, along these lines. We're in a very dangerous time. And that's why I am proud of Texas. Because I went in there like a wild rhinoceros with my First Amendment, letting them know that we were outraged and tired of being sexually abused. We can't fly down to Mexico on a holiday and go to the beach because I will not watch my children uh, have uh, you know, people grab their genitals. And, and, and that's a normal response. They're trying to break our will to condition us. But the good news is more and more of the TSA is saying they're going to try to back off of the body scanners. Congress is moving to cut the funding so they can't buy more scanners, and so they can't upkeep the others that microwave oven you, because they know that they've unified the people against them on a nonpartisan issue. Liberal, conservative, libertarian, socialist, doesn't matter. Nobody likes this, and we all know it's a joke. It's security theater. Now, that said, look at what happened uh, with a group of uh, demonstrators that peacefully went into the Jefferson Memorial, Mr. Liberty, and simply quietly, silently danced. They did that uh, because months previous on Jefferson's birthday, a group of libertarians via Twitter said, hey, let's go meet up, you know, like-minded people at the Jefferson Memorial at night. Nobody's there, it's open. And uh, let's, you know, dance. They got arrested then. And when you watch these cops arrogantly, they say, what's the law? They won't even tell them. They won't talk to you, you're scum. You'll follow their orders. They couldn't tell them the law. There is no law. Uh, they have a federal ruling saying it should be solemn. Well, that federal ruling violates the First Amendment. Uh, I mean, speech may not be fun for some people, but it, it, it's absolutely paramount in this country. It's why it's the First Amendment, even before the Second. And the cops begin to tackle people, choke people. When they begin to speak back to the godlike police, the policemen begin to shove them. 
And it just shows you how far our country's fallen. They are trying to sell us on tyranny in the name of security. If we don't have our basic liberties, America isn't America anymore. And they're going to have another demonstration uh, coming up uh, tomorrow, Saturday, high noon, at the Jefferson Memorial. I wish I could be there. But for folks all over that region, please get there. Uh, and I know Thomas Jefferson, looking down from Valhalla, uh, would certainly be proud of you. And if they crack down on you know, the thousands that are going to show up, well, the next time it needs to be millions. Because we've got to continue to illustrate that this system is authoritarian and dictatorial and out of control. Because if the First Amendment doesn't stand, all the other amendments will fall. And you notice all the other amendments are now under attack. We have to exercise this freedom to let them know they're our servants or we will lose it. Yeah. Yeah. My friends, history is repeating itself. We are all in peril. This is being done because foreign banks have openly hijacked our country, bought off our politicians. They are sucking us dry to economically implode us to come back and loan us our own tax money back at loan sharking interest. We are being economically conquered. They're taking the velvet glove off the iron fist right now because we are already in a depression. And if we wake up and take our government back through the state and federal government and use the, the, the uh, systems our founding fathers gave us, the geniuses they were, and I've studied history, folks. There's nothing better. that They were geniuses. If we use those systems, they want to try to block us. So we've got to continue to face these people down at every front and point out what tyrants they are, and we can save this republic. The answer to 1984 is 1776. I'm Alex Jones. This is the Info War. That was Alex Jones, but this still is the info war that we're all fighting. And uh, you, you get the idea that, you know, we're any safer because somebody is, you know, slammed to the ground and handcuffed for dancing in front of the Jefferson Memorial. I mean, how ludicrous can it get that, that the idea that that has anything to do with Homeland Security? I mean, how on earth do, you know, any of this uh, crackdown of civil liberties has nothing at all to do with terrorism. It has everything to do with control and putting in the national security state. Well, we're going to go ahead. Uh, we're, if, in case you didn't notice, we're exactly three months away from the 10th year anniversary of 9-11. And uh, I'm, you know, I'd, I like to get away from Alex Jones just for a minute and let's go to Richard Gage and his group Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. That's really what this site, what inspired this program. And, uh, you know, like Richard Gage always says, you know, we don't like to speculate. We like to only talk about evidence-based facts. And uh, then along this comes Jesse Ventura. Now, Jesse Ventura... It, I, I admired him for his stance on 9-11, but recently he started talking about Judy Wood's stance on 9-11, the directed energy weapon nonsense. And uh, it's really sad because it makes me think, well, you know, if, if all Jesse can do is parrot back something that sounds scientific, then you know, his original support of 9-11 is meaningless to me. It, it just, he was just parroting back something somebody said to him, and uh, he didn't really understand anything that he was talking about. And, I mean, obviously, if he's talking about Judy Woods and her directed energy weapons as being even a remote possibility, then he's completely scientifically out of his mind. And, you know, he's not supposed to be a scientist, but he's supposed to be able to rely on people who are. And... He's relying on Judy Woods. <laughs> well, anyway, but getting back to Richard Gage, um, he's coming out with a, an anniversary DVD, a 10-year anniversary DVD. And uh, we have tonight two quick cuts. Well, they're not exactly quick. The first one's Eric Lawyer. We showed last week at a different cut from a few years back. But this one is a seven-minute cut. Um, He's the uh, founder of Firefighters for 9-11 Truth. So let's hear what he has to say. And when, he, when we get back from that, we'll listen to Kathy McGrade, a, a mechanical engineer, uh, who will also appear on this anniversary DVD. 
So let her, let her. I first started questioning the official story in 2008. For years, I had to believe that I had believed and aggressively defended the official story. I I was I went out to New York after 9/11 happened to show support and attend funerals, and uh, to just be there in any way I could. And I was down at Ground Zero, you know, several days when we watched them pull out just pieces, and it was you know so emotional, and I just couldn't go there. And so I was so angry, and I just wanted you know when I was told that what terrorists did it, I just wanted to attack. I mean, I was just in that that mode where I just I wanted revenge, really, is what it came down to. And so I really couldn't go there. And my lieutenant for years had been asking me, he'd been questioning me about it. And he's, he just pointed out things that didn't make sense. And he was talking about Tower 7 and just, and I really didn't even know about Tower 7. I'd seen it and I'd seen it those first few days, but I just erased it from my memory. And now looking back on it, it was because it was shown the first few days in the media, but it was never talked about again. And it's still not really shown that often. And so he kept trying to bring that up. And I wouldn't even watch his videos. I wouldn't watch anything. I wouldn't look at the pictures because I thought he was crazy. And what I didn't understand is he wasn't questioning our country, he was questioning an event. I started looking at the evidence. I saw some things that didn't make sense. And being a firefighter, I realized when I saw this evidence, I've been in enough fires. What we're saying with Firefighters for 9-11 Truth is there's evidence that doesn't make sense. Not only that it doesn't make sense, we're saying that there's national standards that need to be followed. And when I started looking into that, I went into the investigation manual. And so it's called the NFPA 921, and it's the Guide for Fire and Explosions and Investigations. It's a guideline. And so it's, it's a resource for investigators to follow, and it's really designed for investigators of smaller departments that don't have the big investigation units that have their own, you know, standard operating procedures. And it's also designed to bring the country's investigation system together. And we call it, in firefighting, we call that the incident command system. And so I went and I got the manual from 2001, and it became the national standard, I think, I believe it was in February of 2001. And I started looking at that, and I said, what should they have looked for? Because I found out that they didn't test for explosives. And the more I started researching, and I went back and I looked at the footage from the original days of 9-11, there were all kinds of firefighters and, and civilians that were reporting explosions. And so just the fact that there were explosions means they need to be investigated. We had terrorists, did they used explosives in 93. We had witnesses to explosions. We have audio recording of explosions. We have overwhelming evidence that there were some explosive events. They should have tested for the explosives. And it's in, in the NFPA 921, it's under exotic accelerants. They bring up thermite specifically, and we had 118 first responders responders report explosions. We had witnesses, tons of witnesses, and we have the auto recordings. We should have tested for it. I mean, it's, it's a common sense thing. At a routine house fire, and several neighbors tell you, oh yeah, we saw flashes go off in three of the floors at the same time. It looked like the fire started in the whole building at the same time. It's a no-brainer. We're going to test that thing for explosives. Any firefighter would know. We're looking for this, the point of origin, and we're always looking for any indicators. And a lot of times we'll interview, well, we, uh, most of the time we'll interview, you know, witnesses or family members or whoever was there. What did you see? What did you hear? Kind of thing. And so if we had reports from neighbors that they said they saw flashes on all three floors, you know, at the same time or close to the same time, we're going to suspect accelerants were used, you know, gasoline, kerosene, any, any type of accelerant, but we're going to test it for that. We're going to look for the, you know, indicators and we're going to test it. So the fact on 9-11 we had 3,000 you know Americans murdered and we had the first three high-rise and steel collapses. We have all these reports of explosions. We have the history of terrorists using explosives. There's no excuse for it. It's criminal in my opinion. It's absolutely criminal that they refuse to follow the national standards and the national standards say that they should be testing that for explosives. And one of the excuses NIST used for not, they have two major excuses why they didn't test for it. And one of them was that it would have been hard. It would have been unlikely. It would have been difficult to bring 100 pounds or more of thermite into a structure. Well, the manual gets into thermite. And if it says if you have melted steel or concrete, which we had on 9-11, and there's videos of it, people can see it. You can also see the FDNY talking about it, where it came down in streams. And again, from an investigative standpoint, that doesn't prove what that, that was molten metal. But because we had witnesses that they saw metal roll, coming down, on the you know the channel rails they need to test for it you know again it's not proving it but we should test for it so the fact that they're not testing for it 
is, is crazy, but one of NIST's other excuses was that there were no blast sounds heard by witnesses or recorded. Well, go to our website, Firefighters for 9 11 Truth, and any, you can just YouTube it. There's so many videos of witnesses from that day that report explosions. There's radio transmissions from the FDNY. We have the transcripts that were recorded you know, back in 2001 of all these firefighters and first responders reporting explosions. There's no doubt they were heard, you know, so they were there. So the fact that NIST says that is absolutely in my opinion, it's criminal. The other thing, though, that Chapter 18 shows is that the sound of an explosion is not a necessary component to have an explosive. So, you know, thermite typically doesn't have that loud boom effect. It's more of a, it's more of a burn. It's a high intense burn. And so they don't address that. The manual does. It says when you have melted steel or concrete, you test for thermite. And so it's not normal for any jet fuel, which is basically kerosene, even gasoline. It's not normal for any of the, those type of kerosene or petroleum fuels to be able to melt steel. It just can't happen. And at Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, that's what we're asking for, is we're asking for an investigation that follows national standards. And NIST, when they did the report, they had absolutely zero evidence for Tower 7. They destroyed all the steel, all the all the basically the bones of the building that would have told us how this first high-rise steel you know structure in history that hadn't been struck by an airplane all it had was a few f fires on several floors and it only been burning for a few hours we've had other high-rises burn much longer this was the sh one of the shortest burning high-rises for well actually it's the, the shortest burning high-rise for a complete failure the way we could have learned from this was analyzing that looking at the steel and seeing how this collapsed and how it failed and which steel members did what well we can't do that because what they did immediately after 9-11 was they started removing the steel the, the debris from Tower 7 and all the towers immediately. They sent it off to, to China to be recycled. So they never had any physical evidence to do the investigation. So that needs to be investigated. I, I mean, the national standards are very clear. We have preservation of evidence. We have spoilation of evidence. There's all kinds of basically standards that you don't destroy evidence. I mean, anybody with common sense knows you can't investigate something unless you have the stuff to look at. I'm Kathy McGrade. I have a bachelor's in metallurgical engineering from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, which I got in 1979. I then spent the next 30 years uh, with three startup companies. The first one was uh, named Starstruck, and we built a rocket for a rocket system for delivering satellites to low Earth orbit in competition with the space shuttle Ariane Spas, other government-funded uh, launch systems. The second was named Metcal, and in that company we melded together two different, uh, rather obscure material properties to make, uh, to make a heating device that would self-regulate the temperature without having a thermocouple feedback loop. It's self-regulated as a matter of the material property itself. The third company was named Crystalloom, and there we used chemical vapor deposition. Uh, we applied that to methane gas, broke open the methane molecule, and deposited diamond down as an, engineer, as an engineering material, thin film diamond. Then after those three startups, I did my own company, which is fail-safe testing. That's what I'm still doing. Uh, I took a non-destructive testing technique called acoustic emission and I applied it to fire service aerials to determine the structural integrity, to evaluate the structural integrity of their aerial ladders. The way I got into 9-11, doing 9-11 research, was when a friend asked me if fire can melt steel. And, they, and he was referring to 9-11, asking can office fires melt steel. And no, it can't. Not an office fire. A blast furnace can melt steel because you're driving lots of oxygen into a closed furnace where you're capturing the heat and driving oxygen in. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel.
and yet we have evidence of molten iron in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, and the, the, the metal pouring out of the side of the tower. And the more and more I looked into it, the more I was horrified by what I saw. One thing I would like people to know is that you don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. I'm asked all the time, why should we not believe the experts and what they've told us? And I always answer with this simple story. One day when I was driving my truck down the road, my truck quit suddenly. And as I was waiting for the tow truck to come, I thought to myself, well, don't just sit here like a stool pigeon. You know, get out of your truck, open the hood, and look underneath the hood for anything that's obviously broken. And I did that, and I checked everything. I checked the oil, I checked the oil temperature, I looked for, you know, fan belt broken, anything, obvious things. Nothing was wrong. But when the mechanic called me and told me that I needed a new engine because it had overheated, and because it had dropped its oil and overheated, I knew he was lying. Because I had opened the hood and looked for myself and thought for myself. And it turned out it was just a cam sensor and I was able to fix it myself. I was able to get the part on eBay and stick it on and watch a YouTube on how to fix it and stick it on and drive away. But the comparison is this. Unless you're willing, we all have to be willing to look at the videos of the buildings coming down. You have to be willing to look for the obvious evidence. And you don't have to be a mechanic, an engineer, an architect to see if it makes sense or not, if what you're, to see how those buildings fall. And then you have to be willing to listen to the expert, or you have to be willing to say to that expert who tells you, here's what happened, no, you're lying. I know that's not true. I know that's not true because I watched the video and I saw the buildings come down. It's obvious because of the symmetry. The symmetry is the smoking gun. Those buildings could not have fallen in perfectly level. It's as if you take a, a, a level with a bubble in the center and watch those buildings come down and that bubble will stay centered the whole way down. And that cannot happen with an airplane hitting one side of the building. It cannot happen that when you have asymmetric damage, you will get a perfectly symmetrical collapse. And all you need to do is look at the videos and see that. Then you have to be willing to trust what you saw and call out the lie. When you look at the evidence of 9-11, there, there is a preponderance of evidence. But I believe there are three smoking guns. And one of them is the microspheres that were found in three different samples from three independent research researchers. The um, R.J. Lee Company, the USGS, and Dr. Stephen Jones's work. All three separately found these microspheres. They're perfectly round. You cannot get a perfectly round sphere of metal from the building tearing apart. The only way you can get that is by starting with a molten, a molten liquid. A liquid will create the perfectly round sphere as it solidifies. There's no other way you could get that. That's one of the smoking guns. The other, I think, is David Chandler's work, which is excellent, the two and a quarter second of free fall in Building 7. And then the third one is, uh, it is very well explained in the article, The Missing Jolt. And that explains how in the Twin Towers, there simply was not evidence of work being done. No work was done to collapse the building below. I think those are the three smoking guns. Beyond that, everything, there is a preponderance of other evidence that feeds those. We hear a lot about the laws of physics being violated if you believe the official story on 9-11. But we don't talk much about the laws of thermodynamics. 
And the same is true that if you believe the official story, then you must believe that the laws of thermodynamics were also violated. The second law of thermodynamics says that heat will always move from the hotter region to the colder region. And what that means is that you cannot get, heat will not migrate towards itself and create a concentration of heat, a concentration of much hotter zones. So therefore, for you to have molten metal in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, in that, that, that molten metal pouring out of the side of the tower, for you to have gotten that material, you had to start with a much, much hotter heat source, such as you would get with an incendiary, for you to get 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit in order to melt the, the steel, melt the iron, to get these, iron, these spheres, these molten spheres. It's very important to understand that heat cannot move towards itself Heat will not move towards itself to create hotter pockets. It will only move away from itself. It will only tend towards cooling. So therefore, your heat source must be something like a chemical reaction, an exothermic chemical reaction that reacts, in the case of thermite, reacts at 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, with that 4,500 degrees, as that heat moves away from itself, there's still enough heat left to do the work of melting the iron. There you have it, and we've got both phone lines, both phone lines, I've got to use the right arm, I guess. Both phone lines open, 288-4442 and 288-4448. Um, feel free to call in on any subject if you'd like to call in and talk about the idea that um, Ms. McGrade was talking about was, was that, uh, you know, heat doesn't just concentrate itself until, like, suppose you have a thousand degree flame here and you're heating something up over it. <laughs> a thousand degree heat gets this up to a thousand degrees. Once this reaches a thousand degrees, this has no more, no more heat goes from this to that. Heat only flows from hot to cold, not from hot to itself or hotter. So once it reaches 1,000 degrees, it won't get any hotter, no matter how long you leave that flame there, because it doesn't get, it doesn't accumulate. So those people who tried to get you to understand that, oh, it, it was burning for such a long time, the, fire, the heat just accumulated till no longer could sustain a solid temperature. Well, um, or maybe you'd like to call in and talk about the idea that Osama bin Laden is being used politically rather than, you know, factually in, in history. Or pick your subject. Maybe you'd like to talk about Jesse Ventura and his new switch to directed energy weapons. Or maybe you don't know anything about directed energy weapons and you'd like to find out more. Well, I don't... <laughs> we'll see what happens on that. But uh, we've got both phone lines for a change. We're not competing with another show on cable access right now they've given us both phone lines so we should be able to really rip once you start calling in um in the meantime i don't want to just sit here and wait so what i'm going to do is play a little bit of an alex jones clip uh with steve pachesnik who's the co-author with uh um tom clancy and his mystery spy novels this is the fellow that Clancy's actually writing about, the, the Ryan character in the, in the Clancy novels. Well, that's Pachesnik. Oh, I hear a phone. So we won't, probably won't go to the Pachesnik just yet. We'll let the phone caller come through. So, uh, but I recommend that you go to the Alex Jones website, or you know, prisonplanet.tv, or, or even go to YouTube and then slash, forward slash Alex Jones channel. Uh, Right now, without a doubt, it's the best source of information in one spot. He covers almost everything. And as I said before, I was skeptical um, about certain things. And then I start following up on his references. And, you know, I'll be darned if he doesn't have it right. Well, uh, okay, caller, go ahead. 
you're you're on 911 was an inside job. You can turn down the speaker in out here. Oh, let me turn. There we go. Okay, go ahead, caller. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I I, uh, I noticed that that Richard Gage he uh, he, uh, he he what he lost his marriage and his house. Yeah, I I didn't hear very much about that, but I did hear about it after it happened, and it seems like uh, you know following the footsteps of Jim Fetzer, not, I don't know if Fetzer lost his job, but uh, Stephen Jones sure did. Fetzer's one of the directed energy people. Um, he was on my show once, by the way, at a uh, live interview, and uh, I tried to ask him about the uh, directed energy weapon hypothesis being uh, reconsidered in light of the evidence of, of uh, nanothermate, and his answer to me was to direct me to a website where he gave lectures on critical thinking. <laughs> well, you can get in trouble uh, talking about this subject. Uh, of course, you, you find a lot of, uh, you know, what do you call that, the, the, the guys that are not truthers, but they're called uh, debu debunkers. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this gets a, this gets a lot of people upset, uh, talking about, uh, you know, 9-11. Right. And, and of course, you know the thermodynamics. Uh, you know the, the going against the laws of physics. And uh, I, I think, with, I think in, if you're a plumber, if you're a craftsman, we uh, call it a heat sink. Yeah. You know when you're trying to weld pipe oh, together yeah, or something like that. Any welder knows about what I was talking about. Right. Right. right yeah. So it's heat sink, thermal conductivity, that type of thing uh, uh, for the for the tradesman. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of trouble uh, when you comment about this. Uh, of course. So it's you know like. Uh, the Richard Gage. Uh, by the way, he's a USC alumni. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. that's how I kind of picked up on it. Uh, he was at USC, I guess, in 2008, and he's uh, trying to get, uh, you know, USC being a private school, uh, and the private schools have a better shot at... Uh, Putting it know, on the curriculum? Yeah, uh, to, to force the... Uh, to force, because they got higher tuition, and, and they're not tied into government money so much. They're, they're, they're able to force uh, the reinvestigation. Did you happen to see a couple of my shows ago when I showed a clip from the Canadian? Uh, yeah, I did. I did. And then right that, that, that's who brought up the, the uh, private school. Right. He was talking about the, the obligation of the institutions of higher education to actually investigate things like this. Right. And so you, you would have to look at your UFCs, your Stanford, and your, uh, your Harvards uh, trying to lead away. And maybe a, a Notre Dame, but they were kind of a religious school. Right, and I, if if anybody out there has you know any connections, or if you're a student currently, um, you know, start putting the pressure on. Well, See, yeah, I think putting the pressure on the college students. Uh, I was at my daughter's graduation uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they had a, a guest speaker from the Obama administration, uh, Munoz. <laughs> that would have been fun. And so she tried to start start off her commencement uh, speech with, uh, oh, you know, rah, rah, re, we, caught, we you know, killed Osama bin Laden. <laughs> yeah. She didn't really get any uh, response except for about two or three guys. And then <laughs> after that, uh, she couldn't do that. But uh, well, my point is uh, to fool private school kids with, who are carrying heavy tuition uh -huh. with all this kind of stuff right here. And, uh, you know, the, the outset, the, this 9-11 only benefited, you know, probably uh, one-third of the working population. Maybe not that much. <laughs> yeah, no, probably not that much. But what I'm saying is, you know, what does it, what does it take to uh, to, to get a twofer? Uh, I guess they call them twofers. <laughs> to, uh, to to turn the blind eye. And you know, I was telling my kids, well, they should just try to uh, try to get the government to forgive all the student loans right now. And maybe we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't, uh, you know, again, <laughs> uh, pressure. Yeah, you could buy us off if you forgive our loans. Yeah, the other thing, too, is uh, uh, getting back to uh, Richard Gage. He's, uh, you know, because he suffered so much. Uh, the more you study all the facts about 9-11, the, the, the iller or sicker you'll get. Oh, yeah, I've, you know, I, I don't know how, to, how I maintain, but I, I just get to this point where something new happens. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, so what they should do is, uh, you know, we should be able to, you know, PTSD went around for such a long time uh, before uh, before it got accepted, you know, and you could get, uh, you know, the, the, the insurance companies to pay for it. Right. And they should pretty much have the same thing. I mean, uh, we should be able to uh, get, you know, uh, you know approach uh, and have the med uh, insurance people, you know, pay for Twofer syndrome. <laughs> that might be a good one. Yeah, I mean, so you got to hit the insurance companies, the education systems. You know, and just, and just call them to the mat that, you know, this thing is real and it exists. 
That's true. And, uh, you know, this A&E 911, I think it should be really open to, uh, you know, the common, uh, all the common people, like, you know, even the religions, you know. that. Uh, That's right. It should you know, be you, you could say Catholics commonly discussed across Jews the dinner table. Muslims. Hey, well, we've got another caller waiting, so i got to yeah. let you go. But please watch again. Our next right. show is the right. 25th. Keep up good work. Right. Thank you. And next caller. Hey. There you are. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I'm enjoying your show here, and uh, uh, just so much goes through my mind every <laughs> time I see this 9-11 stuff. It's what I call uh, COBS, cleverly orchestrated bullshit. <laughs> We've been wrapped up in this stuff for so long, and and it really, I'm, I'm, I know it sounds kind of funny, and I, I don't mean it that way. It just amazes me how w government organizations are so well aware if they keep passing the ball around to enough people, nobody can ever really make anybody stand to the front and answer for something. Right. And that's what they're doing on this more than anything. And, you know, I mean, come on. I mean, the proof of this is one of the things that you showed. When the government gets so full of itself that it really thinks that we're going to be okay, whether we like it or not, with having them stick their hands down our pants. Like the TSA, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and of our children, too. And that and we'd well, actually buy it as being part of Homeland Security. This is necessary to keep you safe. Yeah, and, you know, they, they, <laughs> keep, they keep thinking, well, we've invented this lie and we wrapped people up in it, so we Man. can move over here and invent this one, too. And uh, just one personal thing that five years ago, and it was weird, it was three months after September 11th, on December 11th, the day before my birthday, I honked at a guy, because I live here in Portland, and I honked at a guy for driving recklessly in a BMW in front of, and, and he, uh, you ever drive up to a red light, and, it's a, and you, you have just enough time to stop your car, you're approaching a red light, and at the last minute, some joker pulls in front of you, so you just lost your stopping space. Oh, yeah. And I and a guy did that in an orange BMW, and I honked at him. A couple minutes later, I was stopped by a Portland cop. I watched him in the mirror. I saw how angry he was approaching my car. I told my seven-year son, who I was actually fearing for his safety because this dangerous driver, I said, this guy's really mad. Don't say anything. I'll try to smooth this out. I don't know why he's coming up here. The guy came out, and I first the first thing I did was ask him, which is my right to ask, why are you stopping me? And he said, and, and he's a public servant, so I can very clearly articulate his name, Officer Chirahama of the Portland Police Department. And he just turned to me and he said, have you ever stopped, been, been stopped before? And I said, yes, I have. And he said, then you know I asked the questions. Oh. And I said, I said, well, as far as I know, that's actually not true. I, I asked something that I have a right to ask. So he asked me for my ID and everything. I, I wear one of these hit bags, and I keep that stuff. I, the van that I had, I had the seat so far up to the steering wheel that I had to back. I, I said, can I open my door and stretch out my legs so I can get in my bag and reset that stuff easily? Because, like, he would not let me do that. <laughs> I mean, he's got a gun, a mace, a taser. He could have slammed the door on my leg if, if worse came to worse. Ten minutes we went around on this, and I said, look, I want to give you my stuff. I can't move my seat back. I've got a board behind me. I've got no option. I've got to, you know, I want to give you what you're asking for, you know, so we can get through with this, and you won't let me. So finally, he let me open the door. He even let me get out of the car, and I opened my bag, the zipper, and I said, here's what you're looking for. I got my wallet out, and as soon as I pulled my driver's license out of the slot in my wallet, you could see in one hand I had my wallet, in one hand I had my Oregon driver's license, which looks nothing like a weapon. I got both arms grabbed, spun around, jacked up behind my back, jammed down in my driver's seat, and this officer's voice was shaking like he was totally out of control. And I, all I could do was look at my son and, and think, what's going to happen now? I did not flinch. I didn't move a muscle because I thought, if this guy will just spring into abusing me like this for no reason, what will he do next? I can hear his voice shaking. I saw that he was mad when he came up to my car. What's he going to do now? And so this stays with me till today. I know I couldn't get justice on it, and it, it was humiliating in me in front of my kid. And you know what it really kind of shows me is that cop, was trying to send a message to my kid 
It was, my kid was sitting there scared to death, and it was like that cop. I, I walked away from there. I didn't get a ticket, nothing. Nothing came out of that except for I got pushed around unnecessarily by a cop. Now on my driving record, it says in capital letters, use of force. So if I get stopped by a cop again, that's the first thing they're going to see. And I talked to my son about it, and I said, you need to know, cops are not your friends. It'd be nice if they all were, but I guess i got to start teaching you at seven years old that cops are not always your friends. And you just saw an example of that. And the reason I bring this up is because part of your video was showing those people getting pushed around and body slammed to the floor at the Thomas Jefferson Memorial. Exactly. Because, and I'm, that's insane. But, hey, whether it's at the Thomas Jefferson Memorial or right here in beautiful Portland, Oregon, it can happen to you. It happened to me, and, I, you know, where do we go from here? I, so I think the powers that be know that they got us and really not enough people stand up i you know i get alex jones newsletter and i'm i watch info wars all the time and i have some of my friends and people saying oh guy that guy's a nut job and huh. i said you live in a cave don't you yeah i guarantee you hey, when sir, you get out there i've got to compliment you okay it's, you've given me the most eloquent little discussion of the of some of the problems that we have in ways that nobody can dispute everybody yep. listening is going to understand exactly where you're coming from and you got to live it before you really understand but it. you and know who really... else was very afraid that cop he was shaking in his boots you heard it in his voice the cops are very very afraid that's why they're overreacting and they think that some of the cops are actually buying into the idea that there are terrorists that are trying to get us somewhere and so they're beginning to go like this and think that everybody they look at really is a terrorist yeah, well, this, this guy had all this time, a good 10 minutes, to know that I meant no harm to him. I said I had my kid in the car. I was just dropping him yeah, off you, at his friends. And this guy with nothing to go on. Combine that in, fear with an agenda to intimidate, yeah, and that's what you get. I thought, man, this guy's coming from a totally different place. He, he wants to make a point. It's not about what I did. It's about what he wants to right do. Up. Hey, we're coming to it at the end Thank of another you. show. We have one minute left. Call again. The next show's on the 25th. Thank you. Love your show. Thank you. And uh, if if that caller wants, if you can get a call in, fine. We got one minute, and uh, we're rolling the credits right now. Now, folks, um, I started a new thing on my computer. Uh, if you go, you know, www.ccfile.net, ccfile.net forward slash 911 WAIJ, you'll get right to my computer and all my downloads. Like, I'm going to be putting the roll ins and stuff for this show on it. And uh, anyway, that's uh, ccfile.net forward slash 911WAIJ. And uh, I guess I'll see you on the 25th. That's the next show we're going to have. We got, I guess we have 26 more seconds here. But uh, like the sign says above me, you can go to my YouTube channel. 251 Omega, and if you click on subscribe, every time I post a, a show, you'll get an email with the uh, link to it. And now we're right at the end, so see you on June 25th.